Father, we thank you for this workers retreat. We thank you for what you've been teaching us. We thank you because of this desire we are expressing to you every time that our constant aim is higher ground. And we desire that you will plant our feet on higher ground. Lord, as we get into your word again tonight, we are praying that you will bless us abundantly in Jesus' name. Amen. And we are praying that you will use your word and your convicting spirit to touch our hearts so that we will be where you want us to be. Amen. And we will do what you want us to do Amen. as long as you want us to do it Amen. and how you want us to do it. Amen. Bless us together tonight. Amen. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We talked in the morning on lordship in the church. And the average person who might be ignorant of what the Bible teaches consistently and constantly would think if Christ is the Lord in the church and he is divine and he is great and his power has no limit, and his ability also has no limit. And obviously, he can do without human agents. Is it still necessary to have human leaders in the church? Coming back to the Old Testament, and coming back to the children of Israel, we have God in the Old Testament called the Shepherd of Israel. And yet, in God's own wisdom, he chose David to be a shepherd with a small s over the nation Israel. So then, that confirms the fact. God has his role of kingship, rulership, and lordship to play. And yet, man has been ordained of God, not all men, but some men to lead, to guide, to shepherd, to pastor the church. Still talking on Israel, we're reading Psalm 80, verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that ledest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubims shine forth. Here, God in heaven is portrayed as the shepherd of Israel and as the one who leads, who guides, who takes the chosen people to the chosen place, an elect race for the elect land. Shepherd of Israel, the God of heaven, mighty and all-sufficient, desiring and choosing to lead his own people. And yet we read in Psalm 78, from verse 70 to verse 72, he chose David also, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the youth great with young. He brought him to feed Jacob his people, and Israel is inheritance. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. God the shepherd, God the king, God the ruler chose a human being to lead, to guide, to feed his own people. And God's strategy or plan has not changed. For the church today, he still chooses, selects leaders that will rule under his authority. Now what happens when a church nationwide or a church local based does not have a leader? The church nationwide or the congregation local without leadership is exposed to much danger. 
And when you think about the local churches you have come from, it doesn't matter how sound the doctrine. It doesn't matter how genuine the experiences of the members in that church. If there is no leader, there will be much, much danger. Or if the leader is dead, though physically alive, is the same thing. He has a name that he lives, but he does not operate. His hands are tied with fear. His conscience sealed with perhaps a load, a burden, a slave burden that God has not given him to carry. His eyes blinded by erroneous teaching. And it is as good as dead. So when there is no leader, or when there is a leader that has a name that he lives, but there is no leadership, is dead, is not able to fulfill the functions and the roles of a leader that is quite alive and awake. There is much danger for such congregation. Or if the pastor or the leader happens to be alive, but there are many ropes of tradition tying him to a tree, like an animal that will tie to a post, alive, make a lot of noise, can kick a lot, but cannot do anything. And there are leaders in denominational circles that are tied by ropes, short or long. And they are tied to the traditions or by the traditions of those men or by some cultures. And it's as if there is no leader. Now you think about it. When governors in states are taken out of the state and imprisoned. Still alive, still intelligent, still able to think and plan and talk, but he is imprisoned. It's as good as there is no leader. And when a leader is imprisoned, or is in captivity, or is hindered, or is not allowed to operate, According to the freedom that God has given in the Bible, it says there is no leader. And if your church is like that, there is much, much danger. One, either that the church has no leader. There are churches like that. That they will say, well, we're just a fellowship. We're just a group of interested believers seeking the Lord. We're just a group of people interested in the ways of the Lord. We're not bothered about having to choose a pastor, a teacher, a leader. God is our leader. There's, such, there's danger for such people. And they say, well, we don't even want to bother ourselves. Leader or no leader, Jesus is Lord. And God is King. And the Bible is our guide. And the Holy Spirit is our teacher. And they deceive themselves to think that the human leader is not necessary. There is much danger for them. Or, I don't know about your own church. I hope it never happens that a stage leader will remove a pastor from a congregation. However small the congregation may be. And fail to give a substitute immediately. Because if there is no leader, there is danger. An immature leader is better than no leader. A leader that is hard, that will beat you on the head, not allow you to go to another person's field, and even punish you sometimes and make you hungry, and you cry a little, a leader that is hard and harsh is better than no leader. And so, let's understand that leadership is important in the church. And I hope that you people do not get to the point where you form gangs in your local churches against your pastor because you think you have some information about that pastor. Understand, Jesus said, ye have not chosen me, I have chosen you. Referring to the leaders of the early church. He chose them. He chose them. And you understand that they were not chosen by a committee. 
a board of elders. They were not chosen by some people that felt that they have the overcharge of the fellowship. And so, when a leader has been placed on a church, if those leaders are tied with criticism, because criticism ties a person more than the physical rope that you can see, is criticized left, right, and center, to the point he doesn't know what to do that the people will appreciate. If he goes this direction, he might be criticized. This direction, he might be criticized. And because of that, he is tied. He's as much as dead. Because he cannot operate. So that means then that you understand leadership is very, very important in the church, nationwide and in the local congregation as well as in every stage. What are the dangers when there is no leader? In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. What dangers are we exposed to when there is no leader in the church? Well, the congregation become prey for wild beasts and for false prophets because it says they are scattered and they become prey. That is, they can be destroyed, torn apart by wild animals, by false prophets, because there is no leader. In Ezekiel chapter 34, Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 5, And they were scattered because there is no shepherd. They were scattered because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. That's the danger when there is no leader. Now, remember, as I said, when there is no leader, that the people are scattered. And I've told you that it may so happen that there is no leader at all, that the congregation is just there, a multitude. And the people say, well, we're not losing anything at all. We have so many of our people who can preach well. There are many preachers. There are few leaders. Not just the preaching. There is somebody that is supposed to be a leader over that congregation. And it is not just preaching. Now, there are people that will say, we don't need a leader. We have so many people in the prayer warriors team. And they can pray and the sick and get healed. They can pray and raise the dead. They can pray and cast out devils. There may be healers, but leaders are still needed. Because the healer, the deliverer, the one that is preaching and ministering to the sick, they will not completely and sufficiently replace those who will be leaders in the church. And there are people that will feel, now we're matured. For a long time we've been studying the Bible. And we've known all the cardinal doctrines of the Bible. Leader or no leader will get on. No, you won't get on without the leader. Because God himself said that his sheep were scattered because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. So that's number one danger. But listen to this. When you, in your own small corner, kill the leader, and you make him as nothing, maybe the state representative, you don't like him, are, are you not surprised that all through the Bible we're not given the physical appearances of the leaders generally. Are they handsome? Are they beautiful? 
Are they tall? You don't know that about Moses. All you know about Moses is the Spirit of God upon him. The power of God upon him. Short, crooked nose, wide mouth, big eyes, an ear that is not black enough, or complexion of the skin that is not quite good enough. We're not told. All you need to know about your leader is that he is called of God. And we're not told about where he kept his certificates before he came back to Egypt. All they needed to know, God called him, God sent him, and he, they are the people that are supposed to be led. What are you finding, about, uh, finding out about your leaders? Their educational qualification? How handsome they are? How good their English is? In fact, Moses was a stammerer. And Aaron could speak better. But all the same, Moses was a leader. The appointment of leaders in the church is very, very significant to God. And he has the prerogative, the final authority on who becomes a leader, who does not become a leader. And when you slash into pieces the state representative or the leader in the local government area, or the pastor of the local church from which you have come. It's as if those people have no leaders because you have killed the leader in their sight. Anything he says, you're not going to pay attention to it. Anything he commands them or instructs them, they're not going to feel that those things are important. And it will appear as if there is no leader. And when there is no leader, there is a great danger in the church. Now, I've told you that number one danger is that they become prey to wild beasts and false prophets. Number two, the congregation will become confused and scattered in different directions, scattered in different programs and fields, each one doing whatever seems right to him. No coordination, no direction, no leading. Nobody that is leading the whole team. You like to evangelize, you evangelize. You like to pray, you pray. You like to come to church, you come. You don't like to come, you don't come. You want to attend a workers' retreat, you do. You want to go to Korea to go and shake hands with Yonggi Cho, you go. You want to go to America to smile in face of Billy Graham, you go. And you want to go and attend Rema camp meeting in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma with um, Kenneth Hagin, you go. No leadership. Nobody to control. Nobody to direct. Nobody to say, sit down, or stand up, or move out, or move in. When there is no leadership, there is confusion. And there is scattering in different directions. And into different programs and different fields. Each one doing whatever seems right to him with nobody to control. And it's a terrible thing for churches, for congregations that have no control. It says in Matthew chapter 26 and in verse 31. Matthew chapter 26. And verse 31. Then says Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. That is, when the shepherd is smitten, then the sheep of the flock, they are scattered abroad. Number three, there will be no sense of direction in corporate profitable outreach when there is no leader in the church. No sense of direction in corporate profitable outreach because there is nobody to plan the strategy, to put forward the strategy, to motivate the congregation convincingly so that they can reach ahead and have that profitable outreach together as a corporate united body. And that means then, 
If there is no sense of direction, there will be no growth. There will be no progress. If there is anything that makes a church to grow, one of the very strong points in church growth is that there is a dynamic leader who has authority, whose authority is accepted and obeyed. But when there is no leader in the church, there will be no sense of direction, there will be no growth, and there will be no progress. And um, how many churches that we have seen that they would say, oh, they started so many years ago. I was in Kenya just about two weeks ago, and I met a minister of God. And they had started in the early 70s, before Deeper Life started. And um, the church had been going on. Then, as we were discussing, he happened to ask me, and he said, by the way, this Deeper Life that we are now hearing about in Nigeria, when did you start? Then I gave him the date. Oh, he said, we started before you. I couldn't say what I could have said. It's not how long you have started. It's in what direction you are going since you started. And when there is no leader in the church, you will not be able to go in, this, in the right direction for growth, for progress. And if you love your stage, those of you have come from a particular stage, Maybe you have come from Bendel stage, or you've come from Benue stage, or you've come from River stage. If that is your state of origin, now it's legitimate for you to want the church there to develop and to grow. Because Paul the Apostle, he said, I have a great body for my own kinsmen in the flesh. You must want your stage to be evangelized. If you have come from that stage, and if the church, Deeper Life Bible Church, from Lagos at the headquarters, from the general superintendent, has placed a leader over your stage, if you love your stage, if you want the growth of the work in that stage, the only thing you can do is to pray and agonize and fast and wait upon the Lord for God to pour his spirit in abundance upon that leader. If you kill him, you destroy yourself. You criticize him, you scatter the flock. You get rid of him, the state is not evangelized. And if God has not removed him, and you remove him, he will not give another person to replace him. If he go ahead, can be a substitute. Somebody that will say, well, Go and stay there because the people in that church, they have killed the pastor. Therefore, you just stay there. He'll be staying there as a figurehead. God had not removed the former one. And the one you have put there is not going to be supported by God. And if you love your stage, and you want that stage to be evangelized, you have a burden you have a concern, you have a vision that this state must be evangelized. The greatest thing you can do is to be on your knees. You see that that man is English is poor. You, why did you recognize the English is poor without being able to go to the bookshop and buy good books on English and say, my father in the Lord, that's what they are. They may be young, they may be tall, fat, slim, father in the Lord. The Lord spoke to me that you need these books. Oh, you say that our pastor does not teach enough on sanctification. All right, that's okay. Go to the bookshop. Get books that are strong, very, very good on sanctification. My father and the Lord, the Lord laid on my heart, this is for you. That's the only thing to do. But to say that he's not preaching on sanctification, he's not preaching on faith, he's not healing the sick, and because of that, you criticize or you kill. The church then becomes a church without a leader. And when there is no leader, there is danger in that place. No sense of direction, no growth and no progress. Number four, danger. With no teacher and leader, God is forgotten. The law is trampled upon. His will becomes unknown. 
the people will soon become ignorant. Now let me remind you, those of you who have gone to school, maybe you went to secondary school, you studied English and chemistry and mathematics and biology and physics and many of, of these subjects. But now for five years, you've been out of school. And the only subject you have been using out of all the subjects who are taught is English. Because you have to read such the scripture, because you have to read the house fellowship outline in English, because perhaps you are teaching the Bible study or whatever it is in the church in English, that makes you remember much of what you have been taught. Then you use a little bit of the arithmetic you are taught when you go to the bank then you know that you add this amount in the bank before, now they give you this, you want to know what remains. That makes you to use a little bit of your knowledge in arithmetic. You went to the market, you bought something, you gave 20 naira, and then you bought something for 30 naira, 70 kobo. If you don't know what change remains, heaven helps you. You have to still be able to know a little bit of arithmetic to get the right change back. Apart from the English and the little arithmetic, what else do you remember? All the history you have been taught, haven't you forgotten the dates? Because something that is out of use will be out of mind. Haven't you forgotten the chemistry and the biology and the physics and all the things you were taught? The same thing with Bible knowledge. Oh, you think I've known it all. The sanctification, the Holy Ghost baptism. But if you move to another church, and there is no leader in that church, and you say, well, after all, all churches are the same. No, they are not all the same. It's like saying all animals are the same. There are rats, there are cats, there are lions. <laughs> it's like saying all men are the same. There are illiterates, there are professors. All churches are the same. There are dead ones. There are spirit-filled ones. Be watchful. Now, you move to another place, and this place you have moved, there is no teaching. And you say, well, I will remember everything. No, you will not remember. If it's out of use, it's out of mind. And that means when there is no teacher, God is forgotten. His law is trampled upon. His will is unknown. That's why it's a great, great danger when your teacher or your leader is taken out of your sight. But are there not people whose teachers have not died, whose state representatives have not been withdrawn, and yet they will not make any move, they won't seek counseling, from the pastor, from the leader in the local government area, nor from the state representative. Why do they do that? Well, they have many reasons. They might say, he is not intelligent enough for him to guide me. That's the greatest reason you have to go to him. Because then God will be able to channel his knowledge through him and he will not be able to take the glory. All the glory will go to God. But those who are theologically overloaded, they will mislead you. But the people that know they are foolish, the people that know that they are ignorant, the people that are relying upon God, saying, God, I need to feed these people, help these people, I need to give the best to them, help me out. Those are the people you need to go to in counseling. Your leaders, your pastors. Now there are people that God has not removed their leaders, and yet they will not seek the help they need. It's like they have no teacher. They prefer to write to America. They prefer to write to far, far away places seeking help and seeking counseling. Somebody was telling me in Lagos here, and uh, he said, now when you get to your church, make announcement and say, all the people that came from such church, such church, and this church, and that church, stand up, that they will stand up, and then uh, that I should tell them, go back to the churches you came from. I smiled, I said, if God has given you that vision to do that in your church, 
He has not given it to me. <laughs> oh, he said that that is what he does. That in fact, sometimes, just some time ago, somebody from deeper life, Bagada, came to him for deliverance. And he prayed for that person. And the person was delivered. And he gave the person a note, go back to your church. He said, good luck to you. <laughs> I don't do that. If they come, they stay. And I don't direct them to go to where they came from. Go back to the Catholic. Go back to the Anglican. Go, to the, go back to Eternal Security Baptist. Go back to traditional Sabbath, Seventh Day. Go back to water drinking, Apostolic. Go back to all the garment wearing celestial. I never say that. I never say that. I have a responsibility. God, when God brings them, he gives me responsibility to watch over them. As somebody that will give accounts over them. And I do not tell them to go back where they are running away from. No light, no teaching, no word, no food spiritually, no care, no comfort. And they run away and I say, go back there and go and die. I'll never do it. But when there is no teacher, when there is no leader, that is what people will do. Because they are not having the responsibility over these people. Now in Isaiah chapter 30, verses 20 and 21. Though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. Oh, what a great blessing. This is more than buying a new car, building a new house, getting the award of a great contract, having a new baby, or having opportunity to travel overseas, having any opportunity to have anything in the world. When your eyes see your teachers, oh, that is wonderful. That's wonderful. Because you know the voice of the shepherd. You know the voice of your teacher. That's why in our own fellowships, in every state, whenever the pastor or the state representative is not around, our people are sad. You mark it. You take a state representative out of the city, maybe even temporarily, for just a week or just for two weeks. It's like they are sick. It's like they are not completely happy. They may get their salary at the end of the month, but Looking at the salary with no, with no teacher around them, the salary doesn't meet the needs of their lives. That's a good church. And you know, they tell us that uh, you deeper life church, that you have too much association with your teachers and pastors. If they're away for one week or for two weeks, then you, you appear as if there is uh, no other person to do anything. That's a Bible church. But they tell us that their churches, they don't care. They can miss them for one year and they will not feel that the pastor is not at home. I don't like to be in a church like that. Where you can miss the pastor, the state overseer, or whatever they are calling them, or their state superintendent, where you can miss him for one year and it doesn't matter to them at all. Oh, thank God for a Bible church. Where the teacher is not removed away from you, and your eyes shall see your teachers. Now, you know, that's what we do when we get to church. You get to church at the state capital, anywhere. And then, as you come to church, you realize that the pastor should have been around. You didn't see the car. You say, ah, uh -uh. you see not there. Instead of kneeling down and praying, and just closing your eyes and, you know, forget about it, you look at where he normally sits. What happened? Did he go out? And then you stand as if you are going to the toilet to go and look where the <laughs> choir where the choir is practicing. And uh, he's not there. You call an usher. You say, bro, come. Did pastor travel? What are you asking about pastor? It's church you came to. Go and be praying. No, no. <laughs> Tell me. Is the pastor around? And people tell us that that is not good. That that's idolizing the pastor. 
but thank God for Bible Church. That you know the value of the leaders you have got. You know the security you have in Christ when the leader is around. And it says, thy teachers shall not be withdrawn into a corner, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. That's what the teacher does. That's what the leader does. When you have been confused during the week, and then you come into the church, and eventually you hear the word of the Lord that gives you direction and a sense of purpose that says, this is the way, walk ye in it. When ye turn to the right, and when ye turn to the left. Dangers of no leadership. I told you, number one, the church becomes prey for wild beasts and false prophets. Number two, the church becomes confused and scattered in different directions, programs, and fields with each one doing whatever seems right unto him. In Judges chapter 21, verse 25, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Today, the young generation of today, they're looking for more liberty, more opportunity. And they're saying that organization is of the devil. Leadership is of the devil. Control is of the devil. Let us go. Set us free. Break the bands. Break the yoke. Because we do not like any direction. They do not want to have any king. But the Bible makes it clear. In the days of no king upon the people of God, there is so much confusion that every man will do that which is right in his own eyes. Now number five. The group, notice what I said. I didn't say the church. The group, it becomes a group, not a church anymore when there is no leader. It's like a herd of animals. No shepherd, just a group. It's like a group of little children pray, playing with no referee, with no goalkeeper, with no goal. It's like a bunch of students in a school without headmaster, without teacher. It's an ordinary group. They are not going anywhere. Even the lunch and the ground they have covered, they are going to lose everything. The group becomes a habitation of darkness, a hiding place for various sins, with no one to correct, rebuke, or discipline. When there is no leader, then you have a group that becomes a habitation of darkness. Haven't you watched in your own states groups of so-called believers? No leader, no correction, no rebuke, no discipline. In fact, they'll tell you in those churches, they say that uh, maybe you are talking with them. And all of a sudden, you saw that your pastor is coming, or your state leader is coming, and you shrink a little. Then you begin to weigh your word. And the person from the other group says, uh, what's the matter with you? Well, I saw a pastor coming. I became conscious of what I was doing. And I started judging whether I'm in the right place with the right people doing the right thing or not. Uh-uh. Just because pastor is coming, you see God. We don't fear our pastors like that. That's why they have problems. That if I am committing adultery and the pastor is coming like this, I go on. You see God, that's why they have problems. That's why they're in trouble. But blessed be the people that have the fear for leadership in their hearts. That they were doing something wrong. Maybe they were going in the direction of, of hell. And they saw the person that have agonized on their souls. Prayed for them. Labored for them. Bringing them to the kingdom of God. And they saw this person coming. And they saw that they have been going in the way of hell. And they became afraid and they shrunk. And they came back to the way of the Lord. Blessed are those people. But the people that can smoke and drink and lie and deceive and fight and quarrel, that even when the pastor is coming and the pastor is saying, don't fight, don't fight, get away out of my sight. Let me do what I like. I won't be in that church. 
when there is no fear for leadership, when there is no control, and when it's just a habitation of darkness, a hiding place for various sins. Somebody came here in, you know, to Lagos, a lady coming from one of the states that I do not want to mention. Not from deeper life. But then he came from that stage and then came to the church in deeper life. And within a month or two, he had discovered a man, a backslider, that was still dealing with to get married to. And then they brought her to me. And I said, when did you come? And she said, last year, October. And I said, when did you discover this man that you are to marry uh, him? And she said, I think, uh, November. I said, from which group are you? Then she mentioned the group and the stage. Oh, I said, is that so? That group? So what they are doing there, you want to do here? I said, go back there. Then I called the editor. I said, look at this lady. You see her anytime coming into deeper life, drive her back to her group. He doesn't, she doesn't respect leadership. She doesn't understand the meaning of leadership. And if many of them come into the church, they just make the church to become another group of a habitation of evildoers. Who oh, you say, can you do that as a pastor? I'm praying for more of the boldness of God to take a whip, drive them out. I only drove her out with the word. I'm still asking for more of the grace of God to do what Jesus did. Take a whip and drive out all those people that are not wanting to get to heaven, only wanting to make the house of God a place, a den of robbers and thieves. And I'm praying that God will help me not to spare the people that just want to make the church a hiding place for adultery, a hiding place for fornication, a hiding place for cheap or unequal yoke in marriage. And God give you the grace to, as a pastor, as a leader, to cleanse the church. Amen. And when you can do that, you show that you have the Holy Ghost within you. But the one that is uh, patting the adulteress at the back, the one that never holds a whip, the one that is always smiling, even if backsliders are drinking and they are becoming drunkards in the church, that one doesn't have the Holy Ghost. Oh, thank God for Peter. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? You have not lied unto men but unto God. And as soon as he said that, that man fell on the ground and died. Nobody went. That's Holy Ghost power. Amen. And here came the wife three hours after that time, mincing delicately and walking majestically and having a extra clothes on her shoulder and having the headgear well placed and came to the apostles to come and receive the praise and, and commendation for good work done for money substantial offered to the church. And here was Peter sitting and the woman came and, the, and Peter said, now tell me, is it so much you sold the land? Yes, pastor. And he said, the feet of the people that carried your husband out they are at the door. They'll carry you out. All those groups, no discipline, no rebuke, no correction. Anybody can do anything anytime. That's no church. That's a group. That's, where, that's what you're looking up to. And you're saying that uh, they have more love in that other church. Uh -huh, because they marry them when they are pregnant. They have love in that church because even when they see you like this, stealing church money, nobody is going to talk. They have love in that church. Even when they see that you are perpetrating false doctrine, nobody is going to challenge you. We don't have that love, the love of the Antichrist. The one that will oppose Christ, the one that will set up another doctrine which is not the doctrine of God, 
And then we'll just be telling the people peace, peace and safety. When there is no peace, that's of the Antichrist. But when the Spirit of God is in you, and you're a leader appointed by God, then you are vigilant. You are watching over the souls of the people. I've told you that when there is no leadership, it then becomes a group of habitation of darkness, a hiding place for various sins, with no one to correct, rebuke, or discipline. Number six, when there is no leadership, the result will be backsliding and apostasy. And there will be final judgment and eternal doom. In Judges chapter 2, Judges chapter 2, from verse 18, And when the Lord raised up judges, then the Lord was with the judge, and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings, by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass, when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers. In following other gods to serve them, and to bow down unto them, they cease not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. When there is no leadership, the result will be backsliding and apostasy, with the attendant judgment and eternal doom. No wonder then that God in his wisdom has appointed leaders in the church. Now already our time is going. And in talking about leaders in the church, the church is composed of individuals and families. And you have leaders in every section of the church. One, there is the head of the Christian family. The head of the Christian family if the whole family belongs to God, and that husband belongs to the church, that's a leader. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, we're told he is a leader. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, we're told he must have rule, bear rule, be authoritative in his house, that everyone in the household will be submissive unto him. Then we go ahead from the leader of the Christian family to the leader of the house fellowship. Just write it down. In Romans chapter 16, verses 3 to 5, again we're told there is leadership in the church, in the house. House fellowship is a church, a group of believers in the house. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 20, we're told of a teacher of babes. There are those who have leadership role in the church over young people. In that same verse, we have leaders over new converts. Those new converts have just come to the Lord. They are babes in Christ. And as babes in Christ then you have leaders over them. Now the leaders may be house fellowship leaders. The leaders may just be charged with the responsibility of follow-up, but they are instructors or teachers or leaders of the new converts. Number five, there are sectional leaders in the church. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, verses 1 to 5. A need arose in the church, and the apostles recognized that it will not be right for them to leave the preaching of the word, the ministry of the word, and then get involved in the important, essential, necessary work of distributing food. Not completely spiritual work, but it was necessary. It was important. And the absence of aid was causing a problem. Now, there are things in the church that are not totally spiritual. 
but the absence of those things will cause confusion and problem in the church that the pastor or the state leader or the local government area leader will not be able to do everything he ought to do spiritually and then you have to find sectional leaders for those things. In the case of the disciples and the apostles in the Acts of the Apostles chapter 6, it was the distribution of food and he chose leaders to take care of that. In our case today, when you have hundreds and thousands of people together, if there are no ushers, there will be chaos. And even though the work of the usher is not completely spiritual, in the sense that it's taking care of things that are physical and things that are regular, yet it's so important because if the ushers are not there, you'll see the lack. Then there should be leadership in that area too. The choir. Suppose there is no leadership in the choir too. That the choir is just there. They're supposed to th sing. But nobody is thinking about the harmony of their singing, about the different parts harmonizing together. Then there will be confusion. And it will be better than not singing at all. That's why there is leadership also in the choir. Now we have discovered that in our retreats, we distribute food as well. We have to buy, we have to store, we have to cook, we have to distribute, and we have to gather the remaining the remnant, and then store again. We have to clean the kitchen. Now, that work becomes necessary. Even though it is not completely spiritual, there is leadership in that area as well. How about fund management in the church? Money comes in, money goes out. Now, that is not completely spiritual, but then there should be leadership in that area as well. Because if there are no people to take care of those areas, because we feel, well, after all, that is not totally spiritual, there will be confusion and chaos. How about our building and maintenance? Can we build without having somebody in charge? That means then there should be leadership in that area. We do a lot of charity work, giving out money, giving out clothes, giving out food, paying for accommodation for people that are having accommodation problem. That's charity work. And again, even though that is not completely spiritual, it's not praying, it is not fasting, it's not casting out devils, it's not preaching, it's not counseling, yet it's a necessary work. And if it's a necessary work, there is leadership also necessary in that area. Say it this way. Work that appears secular or social with little emphasis on spiritual must not be neglected and therefore there is still leadership needed. Then there are elders in spiritual matters. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. If you read that verse aright, there are two categories of elders in that verse. Elders who rule well, especially, which means there are some people who are not laboring in word and doctrine, and yet they are elders, there are other elders that have the work and the responsibility of word and doctrine. And it says, grant them double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. Now listen. Even in our church, I have found unnecessary competition among workers. Somebody is an usher. The other one is a preacher. And then, because this fellow is a preacher, he counsels, he prays, he takes decisions, and this one is an usher. And the people, they respect the one that is ministering in the word and doctrine more than the one that is the usher. The usher comes into competition. And he says, we are all leaders. So why is there an emphasis, a respect, an honor 
for the one that is preaching the word over the one that is standing at the gate. It should not be so. It looks like we are becoming a Catholic church. There is a pope, there is a church father, there is a peace, a priest. Sir, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. That's the Bible. If God has made you an usher, stay in your position. And understand that the Bible itself with the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, gives more honor, more respect to the one that labors in word and doctrine. And um, even though we've not taught the people exactly like that, the Spirit of God in them makes them to understand that spiritual things are so delicate that the people that are there, they deserve our respect, our honor if they are laboring in word and doctrine. For the scripture says, Thou shalt not muscle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Now we come to another general thing about our attitude to leadership. As I have said, we respect our leaders at least more than other people outside. But I find a cankerworm entering into the church. I find a type of attitude entering into the church. And that is to say, after all, we're all children of God. Yes, sir. After all, all the people in the plane, we're all passengers. So that means that you are equal to the pilot. So he can come out of the place, he's directing the airplane. And since we're all passengers, you too can get there and kill yourself. <laughs> so it means that when we're on the, on the top of the sea, a large, deep, deep ocean, in this great ship, then there is the captain, there is the one that is sailing. And then the passengers can say, after all, we're all human beings. Then remove him and get there and drown. And then when we are in a school and we have students, we have teachers, we have principal, then the teachers will say, after all, we all have degree. That's all right. We all have degrees then remove the principal and get there, and there's nobody to pay the salary at the end of the month. <laughs> We're all believers, but our positions and privileges make us different. That's what the Bible says. That to grant honor to the people that labor in word and doctrine. Now what can we do without these people labor in word and doctrine? Think about it. You have a church with perfectly trained ushers wonderfully singing choir, with instrumentalists, with cleaners that are just superb and wonderful, with builders that have raised up a big church, only there is nobody in charge of word and doctrine. Where do you go? With all the church building, with all the choir, with all the ushering, you still go to hell. Oh, they demand respect. And I find some people that have been in Deeper Life Bible Church for seven years, for eight years, for ten years, and uh, they would say, uh, say Trev, it's just name, when did he come? <laughs> I've been in this church at uh, Ilori Retreat, I was there. When did he come to Deeper Life that they made him say Trev? My sister, when was Josiah born that he became a king? Eight years of age, the anointed of the Lord. Don't touch him. Nobody ever told you that. That when God places a man or a woman in a place, he becomes the anointed of the Lord. Look at David and look at all the other people. Now, before he became king, even though he had been anointed, he got to the battlefield and his brother was just a soldier in the army. And he said, what are you doing here? I know the pride of your life. You want to see what is going on here. And because that boy was not on the throne yet, 
He said, ah, is there not a cause? But then later he became a king. And Eliab, if he wasn't dead yet, he was still in the army, but there was somebody giving instruction. And that was David. And he carried out every instruction because that man was on the throne. Why do you say you are sanctified and you don't keep to the word of the Bible? Why do you say you are a Bible Christian and you never keep to the word of the Bible? You have no respect for anybody except yourself. You're not going to, you are not going to take the word of any leader except yourself. If there is no leader, can you do his work? Can you carry his body? Can you preach his message? Can you agonize his agony? Be careful. The Bible tells us, give them honor. Give them respect. Now, that doesn't mean that if somebody is living in sin, that we'll say, okay, we'll respect him. But even when he's living in sin, his judgment is not in our hand. There is law and order in the church of God. Somebody has done something you think is wrong. And then you are going about slashing him, destroying him. Look at Peter. You must be one of them. Myself, look at my face. I never knew him. Then a maid came and said, the way you are talking, you are one of the disciples of this uh, fellow, of Jesus Christ. You saw me there, and he began to curse. I never knew him. Then as they were around the fire, because of the cold, somebody said, your speech bereared thee. You are one of them. And they began to curse if I ever saw him. And the cock crew. And he wept. And he went away. And Matthew knew about that thing. And maybe said, one day when I write the gospel according to St. Matthew, the whole detail I'm going to put down. <laughs> and then came Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. The past had been forgiven, blotted out and cleansed. And the disciples were all together, and Matthew was there. Nathaniel was there. Philip was there. John was there. And Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren, as it was written, Judas had gone away into his own reward. Now we must appoint another one. The leader has arrived. And everybody shut up. All those things they knew, in Matthew chapter 26, they kept quiet. What story do you know that you are carrying about? When the day of Pentecost has come upon that man, he's been filled and saturated with the Spirit of God. God has forgiven and forgotten, and you are still carrying story about. And they made him state leader, they made him this, they made him that. Who are you? You want to die? You want to kill yourself? Be careful. Spiritual matters. It burns more than fire. And when God has raised up that man, and the day of Pentecost came, and he started speaking in tongues, and then the people were amazed, and they said, what is all this? And then Peter rose up with no sense of shame, with no remembrance of any guilt. And he said, men of Israel, hear me. And the rest of the eleven, they stood behind him, those who never had any fault recorded, John, the beloved, Matthew, the past publican, and all these other people that have been cleansed and washed, and nobody knew what they were doing during the time of the trial of Jesus. Only we knew what John did. Everybody, they stood behind him, and he gave that message, and he called them to repentance. And 3,000, they fell on their knees. What shall we do to be saved? And it was Peter that said, repent, and you shall be baptized with water uh, for the remission of your sins. And after that, you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you. What are you carrying stories about? You children. You don't read your Bible. You don't understand leadership in the Bible. And Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, as they were going at the beautiful gate, Peter and John, read your Bible. They came out of the prison or they were brought to the leaders in Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. Two of them, Peter and John. And they asked them, by what power and what name have you done this? 
And we are told Peter, not John, Peter, not John, was filled with the Holy Ghost. Even the Holy Ghost became partial and just poured it upon Peter again and said, John, you look on and let your leader talk. That's the Peter that did all those things in the past. You people read your Bible and, and stop killing the pastors who have been forgiven, who have been cleansed, who have been appointed by God to do something for the glory of God in this generation. I thought I'd be able to talk to you on consecration and many other things, but rise up and let us pray. Our Father, we thank you very much that we are alive today. We have heard your word. You have spoken to us. And here we are. We are very sorry. They passed. We count it gone. We believe there's going to be a new beginning. Amen. You are the only one who can forgive us. There is no other person we can go to. We'll tell we have done wrong before. We are repenting right now. Amen. Forgive us. Amen. Cleanse us. Amen. Wash us. Amen. Now we can look at the future. Very bright. Because our leaders are our leaders. You have pointed them anywhere we see them. There will be joy in our hearts. Amen. Anywhere we see them, O oh God, there will be perfect peace. Amen. We are praying, Lord, as we go back with our leaders, all of us together, we are, we are very, very sure that people, they are going to see the glory of God. Amen. Because when we respect our leaders, they will respect us. Amen. When we respect our leaders, God himself will be happy. Amen. Father, we thought we know so much, whereas we are so much ignorant. Thank you for your word today. Well, you have done your work. Your word will correct, it has, it has corrected us. It will reprove, it has reproved us. It will perfect, it has perfected us. We are never the same. Each of our Churches of the state, we are sure we are never going to be the same again. Amen. Oh Lord, we glorify your name. Thank you for the pardon. Thank you for the revelation. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your forgiving for forgiving us. Thank you very much, Father. We glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm pressing on the
today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to take out the board. I just thank God for all his provision. I just bless you with grace.